Hello everyone and welcome to an interesting lecture in the topic of STEMI and today we are answering a very important question that many cardiologists ask themselves when they see a patient presenting with stemical chest pain and his ECG shows left bundle branch block is this left bundle acute or chronic? So our ILOs today is how to differentiate acute from chronic left bundle and ECG and how to make a clinical decision in this situation. First of all, how can left bundle occur in the setting of STEMI? We know, of course, that the left main coronary artery bifurcates into LD and LTX. And, of course, we know that the left bundle branch block receives its blood supply from the set of perforators arising from the LED. And so, when there is proximal or near osteal occlusion of LED proximal to the first set of perforator, this leads that all the blood supply is diminished in this territory. And so, the set of perforator doesn't receive enough blood supply, leading to acute left bundle branch block. That's why acute bundle is included in the C elevation myocardial infarction in case that the previous ECG shows normal resting sinus rhythm or there is no previous documentation. At the time, acute lift bundle can be considered as an equivalent of STEMI and it indicates high risk prognosis because it usually indicates very proximal LED occlusion. In most of the cases, it would show extensive anterior STEMI with poor prognosis if not revascularized. So, the answer, the question is, is it chronic left bundle or acute left bundle? If it is chronic left bundle, I would assume that the patient has structural heart disease and he is having the same chronic left bundle branch block that was present in his previous ECG, even if it was not documented. And acute left bundle, I would assume that this patient is having ST elevation myocardial infarction and I would rush for the cath lab for primary PCI. So, I want to decide whether it is chronic or acute left bundle. So, we depend on three famous ECG criteria in order to differentiate it. The first one is the Scarbosa criteria, then the Caprera and Chapman sign. Of course, the Scarbosa is the most important because we can apply in most of the situation. Scarbosa criteria depend on three criteria. The first one is ST elevation, more than or equal one millimeter in a lead with upward QRS complex, which we call concordant. Concordant means that the ST elevation is concordant with a complex. That means that the complex is positive in these leads. For example, V5 and V6 are showing positive complex in case of left bundle branch block. So if there is ST elevation more than or equal one millimeter in V5 or V6, which are showing positive complex, so this is concordant ST elevation and it takes five points. So it is the most important criterion in these criteria is the ST elevation, which is concordant with the complex polarity. The second one is ST depression more than or equal one millimeter in lead V1, V2, or V3, and it is also concordant because these complex, which are the right precordial leads, usually show predominantly negative complex, either QS pattern or small R with an S wave. And so ST depression here is concordant. So if there is concordant ST depression more than or equal one millimeter, it takes three points. Then the last one, it was originally mentioned that it is ST elevation more than or equal 5 mm in a lead with downward QRS complex, so it is discordant, discordant ST elevation because in the right recorder lead, as we mentioned, the complex is predominantly negative, so when there is ST elevation here, it is discordant with the complex, so it is more than 5 mm in these leads, it takes just two points. So that's why we also mention, we always mention that it is accepted to see ST elevation up to 5 mm in right precordial leads. It is not considered STEMI, but if it is exceeding 5 mm at that time, I would consider it significant and I may assume that this patient may have acute on the branch block. Of course, three or more points gives 90% specificity of STEMI, but sensitivity is 36 just. So, if this patient takes three or more points at the time, I would assume that most probably it is acute left bundle. I, I would better arrange for primary PCI in order to exclude culprit artery occlusion. Of course, there was a modifica modification of the Scarbosa criteria called the SMES modification. The third one, which was given just a definite value of 5 mm discordant ST elevation, was modified to be a ratio instead of just a definite value. In this case, it is a ratio of the ST elevation measured at the G point to the amplitude of the R wave or S wave, as we mentioned here. So, for example, if we apply the classic example, that the right record we read here is showing about more than 25% elevation in the ST segment, discordant with the complex amplitude, which is S wave here. So, I would assume here that this is significant for us. So, not just more than 5 mm, if it is just more than a quarter of the amplitude of the S wave, or in the other example, more than a quarter of the amplitude of the R wave, I would consider it significant to get two points. 
and so it is a matter of ratio rather than an absolute value. So this was a modification to the Scarbosa criteria. Remember that the presence of concordant is C elevation, which means in Levy's positive theory, as deflection appears to be one of the best indicators of ongoing MI with an occluded infarct artery. So whenever I see left bundle with C elevation, which is concordant, so it is in V5 and V6 most probably, and it is more than one millimeter, it is very suggestive of myocardial infarction and STEMI, and so we need to go for primary PCI. And that's why, of course, Scarbosa criteria were put in the ESC guidelines of STEMI in order to help the clinician to differentiate whether it is acute left bundle or chronic left bundle. Ventricular pace rhythm has the same problem that it shows left bundle branch block because it is RV pacing. And so if the pacing is coming from the right ventricular reads, it would give, of course, left bundle branch block morphology. So we can apply the same rules here in order to differentiate whether it is acute or chronic because it's very difficult. Up to that some clinician, if the patient is not pacemaker dependent, he may bring a programmer to stop the permanent pacemaker temporarily, assuming that, assuming that he has intrinsic rhythm. If he has intrinsic rhythm, we can do this and order to check the ACG of the intrinsic rhythm whether it shows C elevation or not, but it is not feasible, of course, in all clinical situations. Remember, also that the same criteria apply to left bundle branch block caused by this rhythm in patients with permanent pacemaker. So whenever you see left bundle, you can apply Scarbosa criteria to help you in this situation. Regarding the other two signs, the cap rare sign is the first one of them. Maybe it is not a very common sign to be seen, but it is very characteristic when you see it. It means that there is a notching of more than 40 milliseconds in the upslope of the S wave in lead V3, V4, plus minus in V5, so mostly in the left precord leads. It shows a poor sensitivity of 27% for myocardial infarction, but it has a high specificity, up to 91% for diagnosing antreceptal semi in presence of all left bundle. So let's see an example for this. Here we can see here that there is a notch or like a slurring in the upslope of the ascending limb of the S wave. And so we can call this like it is a capriar sign. It starts usually from V2, V3, V4, may extend up to V5. So usually it is like starting from the right recorder leads, then going to the left recorder leads. So this sign, when I see it at the time, I can assume that most probably it is acute left bundle, not chronic left bundle, and I may consider to go for primary PCI for this patient based on this sign, although it is not very common to be seen. Here as well, we can see this sign here, that there is notching in the upslope of S-wave in V2 and V3, so it is suggestive of ongoing myocardial infarction. So it can appear also in patients with RV pacing as a sign suggesting the presence of antiraceptal STEMI. So also when you see a notch in the upslope of the S-wave in a patient with pacemaker at the time, I may consider that this patient, is if he is presenting with typical chest pain, at the time I can consider him as STEMI and better to have chronic angiography. Regarding the Chapman sign, it has the same idea. It is notching here more than 40 milliseconds, but it is in the upslope of the R wave in lead 1, AVL, and big 6. So we are speaking here about the lateral leads. It has a poor sensitivity, but high sensitivity for diagnosing anterior STEMI. So we can see here in this example that we have notching in the upslope of the R wave in lead 1, AVL, and B6. So it is called Chapman sign and it is suggestive that this left bundle is most probably acute left bundle caused by STEMI. The question now, shall I depend on the ACG criteria alone to differentiate whether it is acute or chronic left bundle branch block or just my clinical sense? This is a question that forces itself on our minds. Of course, ACG criteria helps us a lot in differentiating acute left bundle from chronic left bundle using Scarbosa criteria or the uncommon ECG signs if they were detected the Chapman sign and the Caprier sign. But patient with a clinical suspicion of ongoing myocardial ischemia and left bundle branch block should be managed similar to STEMI patient regardless whether left bundle is previously known or not. This means that if your clinical sense is believing that this patient is clinically unstable and he's having typical chest pain which is a new answer for him and I don't have previous documentation for left bundle in order to decide whether it is new or it is old and the ECG criteria are not like helping me a lot in differentiation and I cannot assume that it is acute or chronic from the ECG criteria alone. Leave your clinical sense. Don't depend on the ECG criteria. We have now another question. The patient was having chest pain and he had left bond branch block. And for example, the patient had another follow-up ECG and then it showed that the left bond branch block resolved completely and the patient told you 
that I don't have any chest pain now and my chest pain resolve also completely. So what is the situation in this example? Of course, intermittent left bundle branch block in patient presented with chest pain should be treated the same as transient ST elevation as we mentioned before. We remember the lecture of transient ST elevation in which we mentioned that if the ST elevation resolved completely and also the chest pain resolved completely, it is considered as a high-risk non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome and this patient should have early invasive strategy within 24 hours. But if the transient ST elevation recurred again at the time, go for primary PCI. So intermittent left bundle has the same clinical scenario. It means that this patient has intermittent occlusion or a stuttering course for the LED occlusion. But in this case, I would not consider him as high risk non-SC because intermittent left bundle indicates there is a stuttering course of proximal LED occlusion, which is intermittent. And so it is a very high risk sign to see a patient presented with typical chest pain and then it resolved and the left bundle branch block with chest pain resolved. At that time, I should consider it as intermittent left bundle and I should go for coronary angiography, not just keep the patient in the CCU because he is a high risk patient and you need to go for primary PCI. So intermittent left bundle is a high risk sign that needs primary PCI, not just follow up in the CCU. What about acute right bundle? Is it the same as left bundle? Of course, as we know, patients with myocardial infarction and right bundle branch block have also a poor prognosis the same as left bundle because it indicates occlusion of the LED proximal to the septal perforators, which gives also plus apply to right bundle branch block. And so it is a high risk. And prime PCI strategy should be considered when there is persistent ischemic symptom in presence of right bundle branch block. And in most of the cases, you would see ST elevation with the right bundle. So, for example, in this ACG, we can see that there is ST elevation here, frank in V2 and V3, with prominent R wave in V1, 2, 3, suggestive of right bound branch block. So, in this condition, I would consider that this patient is having anteroceptal ST elevation myocardial infarction and he's having as well acute right bound branch block. And so, it is a high risk sign and you need to go rushly to the cath lab for primary PCI. Another example here. We can see that there is ST elevation in V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So we are speaking about extensive anterior STEMI with formation of pathological Q here, but there is prominent R waves such as a right bundle branch block morphology. So this patient is having extensive anterior STEMI with acute right bundle, and it is a very high risk sign, and you need to rush to the cath lab. So at the end of our lecture, we understood today the clinical significance of acute left bundle branch block and why we consider it a very high risk sign in ECG. What are the ECG criteria that help you to differentiate acute from chronic left bundle branch block? And our take home message today the clinical sense should take the upper hand in differentiation over the ECG criteria. ECG criteria are very important, but your clinical sense is much, much more important to combine with the ECG to help you decide. And these ECG criteria also can be used in left bundle branch block caused by pace driven as well. Thank you very much for your watching.